So, um, it's lovely to see uh, many people here, uh, and I've got a question for you in a moment, but just before I do that, let me introduce uh, you to myself a little bit more. Um, so, I'm Peter, I live in Oxford, and I'm uh, married to Lynette. I've been married for 26 years, believe it or not. Uh, someone asked me whether I got married when I was 10. Um, <laughs> nice compliment, but you know, I, uh, so Lynette and I got um, married uh, out of university, and uh, we've got three children. Uh, no, no longer children. They are Sam, who's 23, Laura, who's 21, and Madeline, who is uh, 17. <laughs> and they love coming from two different cultures. And uh, my wife and I have dedicated uh, our uh, lives to uh, finding out and trying to understand different cultures as much as we can. And to see how this book, the Bible, uh, speaks into many cultures, not just um, Singapore. So, my question, which I'd like you to just very quickly turn to the people next to you and ask each other this question, where do you call home? Where do you call home? <laughs> Chat for a moment and I'll bring you back. Singapore and uh, uh, I grew up um, just south of Manchester. Uh, actually Singapore is um, probably the place that I've had the longest association with in terms of a long, longest continual uh, visits. We lived there for four years. Uh, we go back maybe every year or every 18 months uh, because my children's only grandparents are there. I've had the joy of being part of uh, a Chinese extended family. Um, also studied there. Um, but um, we live in the UK, we've lived together, well, lived in the UK continually for about 20 years now. <coughs> uh, and sometimes I feel a little guilty that I have taken my wife away from her home country. Uh, but actually, she enjoys living in the UK. But at uh, Chinese New Year in particular, she feels a little homesick. And it is quite often uh, when I'm talking to international students, uh, it's an enjoyable experience to come to another country. But there are some moments, I think, perhaps, when we all feel a little homesick. Sometimes when I was living in Singapore, I'd turn the air conditioning up full, uh, so it was as cold as possible, and then read a book about Britain. Just, <laughs> just occasionally. Um, I couldn't kind of uh, mimic the cold rain, but then yeah, that was all right. One Malaysian student I heard of, who uh, was studying in Australia, so the time zones were not so different, apparently had she did a one year's master's and the whole year she had her Skype on continually linked to a home computer that was at the end of her dinner table. And so for, I don't know how she quite managed it, but every day she was in continual contact with her family. It's almost like she hadn't actually left home. Um, that's fairly extreme. I won't ask if anyone's actually done that. But home, uh, I suppose, as a couple who come from different countries, is an interesting one. Where is home? Well, I suppose home for me now is Oxford, but our children uh, feel that both Singapore is home and the UK is home. But of course, home is not simply a geographical place. Home is where we feel that we belong. And it's more to do with people than location. And um, home, or rather, the urge to belong 
is a powerful human emotion. We all want to belong, whether it's in our families, uh, amongst friends, at work, at university. We want to feel that we're part of the group. We want to be inside people, not outside people. Now, some years ago, when my children were small, I was taking my youngest daughter to nursery school, and as I was queuing up, uh, wait, waiting for the gates to open, I noticed an older Chinese couple bringing their grandson to the same school. And over the following days, I, I recognised that they didn't speak any English, so I used my very limited Chinese to try and speak to them. And they were really happy that there was at least someone who could say something to them in their home language. And one of the questions, <laughs> we ended up talking about the same thing every day because my language is not that good. But they said, do you have a Chinese name? Uh, and um, I said, well, actually, yes, because when we lived in China, my wife gave me, she said, you have this Chinese name, it'll make things easier. And she gave me the family name, Gao, which simply means tall, because I'm tall. <laughs> I told them this, they were so happy, because their family name was also Gao, and they weren't very tall, they were quite small, but they, they were really happy that we shared a family name. They said, Zizi Ren, which is, you are one of us, you are family. I was thinking, well, actually it was a made up name just because I'm tall. But to them, being away from home and finding an Englishman with the same surname as them was very exciting. We will do almost anything to belong somewhere. And in some cultures, there are very specific rules that show whether somebody belongs or not. Uh, in the West, we tend to be a bit more individualistic, so the rules are less obvious, but we all want to belong. And everything that we do, from the energy we put into our studies, the way we speak, the music we listen to, the way we dress and do our hair, is all done, at least partly, because we want to belong. We want to be part of the group. And if one of the greatest pleasures in life is to feel that you belong, then one of the most painful experiences is to not belong, to be rejected. Um, a little while ago, my daughter is at Ubosh. My daughter's at university. One of her friends uh, grew up in a home um, where her parents had split up and she lived with her mother. Uh, and when she was about 13 or 14 years old, she came home from school one day to find the doors locked and the locks changed and all her belongings in bags outside the house. Her mother had just basically decided she didn't want her anymore and thrown her out. I, I, I find that very hard to understand. But her mother even held a funeral for her daughter, pretending that she was dead. Now. Uh, her father stepped in and, and took her in. But you can imagine, or maybe we can't imagine, the sort of damage that would do to a young person to be rejected by the one person you'd have thought would accept her. But this world tends to say to us in all sorts of different ways, you're not good enough. You're not cool enough. You're not slim enough. You're not rich or successful enough. You did something that we hate you for. We simply don't like you. Well, I'd like us to read a very short story in the Bible about a man who felt very, very rejected. Uh, and if, um, you can, if you've got this book on your table, it's a part of the, the Bible called the Gospel of Mark. And it's on page six, right at the front. And actually, we have, I believe, um, the translation in Chinese, if you'd like to use maybe both of them together, um, and so this is a card. So it's on page six, and um, it's uh, about two thirds of the way down, um, and it says, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. Just kind of smile at me if you found the page. That's one way to get people smiling at me. Okay, here we go. So it says, a man with leprosy came to him, that's Jesus, and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. 
He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am with it, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices Moses commanded you for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly that stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. I love that story. It's a very short one, but it's a really lovely story about a man who didn't belong anymore. Maybe this man once belonged, but now he was completely excluded. We don't know much about him, or we know almost nothing about him. He could have been married, he could have had children, he could have been rich or poor, we just don't know. The only thing that we know about this man was he had a terrible disease, leprosy or something similar. The kind of disease that would have affected his skin uh, and maybe um, uh, so leprosy destroys the nerving endings uh, and uh, your extremities. So maybe his hands and his face would have been damaged and disfigured. He may have over time become uh, horrible and disgusting to look at. And in the days before modern medicine, there was no cure for leprosy. Yeah. The only thing that they could do was to, to prevent it from spreading by excluding this man, removing him from the community. And that meant a terrible, slow death sentence. And one moment he belongs, one moment maybe he's got his family and his friends and his work and a life. And the next moment, just because he's got this disease, he's driven out to live on his own or with people who suffer from the same disease, no longer allowed to kiss his wife, hug his children, no longer able to work or visit his parents or celebrate with his friends. His life is over and yet he's still alive. And worse than that, he had to warn people that he had this disease. So if you, if you walk near to him, you'd have to say, keep away from me, I'm dirty. Imagine having to say that to people. And then there is the hatred and the shame. Because diseases like that frighten people. They didn't like it to think it could happen to them. So they thought, well, maybe, maybe God is punishing him for doing something very bad. That's why he's suffering so terribly. Keep away. We don't want anything to do with you. This man had no hope. Except one. Jesus. Now Jesus was already becoming quite famous at this point, so much so that he was finding it hard to, to even get into the towns where he wanted to, because so many people were coming to him, he found it hard to actually be with the people who most needed his help, because he was having a lot of attention. But in verse 40, um, this man finds Jesus, and falls on his knees, and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Not, you can cure me, or you can heal me, but you can make me clean. Now, it's always been interesting to me to, to see how different cultures uh, regard what it means to be clean, very differently. One man, uh, when we were in uh, Athens, in, in uh, Greece, on a family holiday, uh, when our children were small, uh, uh, we were going past the shop, and a man uh, came out and, and made a big fuss of my daughter who was three and pinched her cheek and ruffled her hair then spat on her head. What do you do as a parent when someone has said, I assume, nice things about your daughter and then went and spat on her head. But he did it because he was, in trying to be nice, he was risking evil spirits hurting her. And so he was making her unattractive to evil spirits. I'd rather he hadn't, <laughs> but in his mind he was uh, he was protecting her from evil spirits, but to my mind, I wasn't thinking about spirits, I was thinking about bacteria. So you say, thank you, I'll go and wash your hair. In some cultures, food is considered uh, unclean, some kinds of food anyway. Uh, and uh, in the West, there's a great interest in pure, natural foods, because we want to feel clean inside. 
We used to run uh, weekends away for uh, international students from Birmingham University uh, and to be hosted with British families. Uh, and one of the questions that's, or issues that we found was when people want to take a shower. So we had uh, British families saying to us, but the students that we have want to shower at night. I'm thinking, yes. <laughs> But, but most people have a shower in the morning, don't they? And of course, it comes from what climate, depends on what climate you come from. If you come from this kind of climate, then the, the place you sweat the most is actually probably in bed. So you want to have a nice shower in the morning to meet people as a clean and fresh person. But if you live in a warm country, you don't want to take the, the sweat and the dirt from the day into a nice clean bed. It's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. When I was growing up, my parents spent a lot of money and time on house and garden, especially front garden. Because nice people, good people, have they look after their house. And there were people in the area whose <coughs> house, their gardens were untidy and their, their houses weren't painted. And you could tell that people thought they were perhaps not so good people. You see, this is the thing that... Um, to many cultures, perhaps all cultures, uh, clean or unclean is less to do with dirt and bacteria. It seems to be a moral thing. The good people are clean people and dirty people are bad people. Or at least that's how people instinctively feel. Now interestingly, Jesus tells us that food can never make us unclean. Nothing that can go into us can make us dirty inside. But he says it's the things that come out of our mouths, the things that we say, our attitudes and actions and even thoughts. Those are the things which make us feel dirty inside. And I suppose that's, maybe if you think about it even for a moment, yes, there are sometimes we say things to someone where you instantly regret it and it makes us feel horrible inside. Or we've broken a relationship and that has affected us on the inside. What do we do about that? When this man met Jesus, he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And the translation we have says that Jesus was indignant, which sounds like he was cross and angry. Well, actually the word is just it's a strong feeling. And other translations say he was filled with compassion. Whatever the word is, it's a strong feeling. Of course I will. Be clean. And Jesus touched him. This man probably hadn't been touched in years. Now, um, Andy, do you play rugby or football? Football. So, so imagine that Andy's just come in uh, and he's been playing football at, out on the fields. And I've just had a shower. And then he says, Peter, I haven't seen you for a long time. And he gives me a big hug. Andy doesn't become clean because I've had a shower. I become dirty because he's been playing football outside. And yet here, Jesus doesn't become dirty by touching this man. It's the man who becomes clean. This Jesus is so, Jesus has this powerful cleanness in the Bible, it's called holiness, which actually can make us clean. Now, in our uh, house, we have, um, sorry, in our garage next to our house, we have a freezer, you know, a, a thing to store food at minus 20 degrees. I'm sure you all know what a freezer is. Uh, and one uh, hot summer, one of the children was putting their bicycle away in the garage and they accidentally knocked the plug and switched the freezer off. We didn't notice for two weeks and then one day I went into the garage and I instantly knew something was wrong. I wasn't sure quite what was wrong. And then I looked over at the freezer and it looked normal. Just a white box. Then I noticed the plug. And I went over to the freezer and I opened it and saw inside it was a, a rotting liquid mess of ice cream that was no longer ice cream, of vegetables and meat that had gone off. It was just awful. So I did what any man would do in my position. I thought, I have no idea what to do about this. I'm too busy right now. So I shut the lid, switched it back on and walked away. 
and left it for a very long time. Please don't ask me how long. <laughs> you see, I think we're just like that. We want to be good people. We hope that we're good people. On the outside, everything seems normal and nice. But we don't want to look too deeply on the inside, because if we do, we might find something there that if we do find something, we have no idea what to do about it. And it might just be too much to deal with. So we keep the lid shut and walk away. Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. Now, as I said, Jesus had problems with so many people coming up to him at this point. He often found it hard to, to meet the people that he really needed to meet. And, and, but there's another reason for Jesus wanting this man to keep uh, his healing secret. Uh, and that was because the man needed to come back into the community the correct way. Uh, as according, to, according to Jewish custom, he needed to show himself to a priest. The priest could check him, give him a certificate of uh, that he was definitely healed. And then he could officially come back into the community. There was a ritual and a sacrifice to perform, an animal to give thanks to God for his healing. Now, you know from the story that the ritual and the sacrifice did not make him clean. It was Jesus who made him clean already. Now, as I said, I think it may have been yesterday or the day before, that in many cultures around the world, there's a common idea about sacrifice. People uh, will sacrifice many things. They maybe make an animal sacrifice or offer food or incense or money, or they may do certain things or perform, perform rituals in order to hopefully be accepted by the God or gods that people worship. But the Bible makes it very clear that there's only one sacrifice that can ever truly make us clean on the inside. There's only one sacrifice that can look inside the freezer of your life and my life and deal with all the stuff inside. And that is not a sacrifice that you and I can make because it's already been made for us. The sacrifice of Jesus himself through his death on the cross. You see, to most people in the world, God is a stranger. And this is why he feels far away, because there are things in our lives which are not right. But most of the time we have no idea what to do about it. When I go to visit my uh, Korean friends, um, like in many cultures, I must take my shoes off at the door. I must. I'm sure it's true of many cultures here. It doesn't matter how clean I think my shoes are. It doesn't matter if I have just bought those shoes, the labels are still on, and I've just walked from the car. I absolutely cannot go into my Korean friend's house wearing my outdoor shoes. If I try to, it's a bit like saying, well, my shoes are clean enough for your house, suggesting that their house isn't quite that clean. It would be quite insulting. If I want to go to my friend's house, and have dinner with his family and enjoy his company, I must remove my shoes. But I must also accept the slippers, the clean indoor slippers that they give me. They're never big enough, but that's another matter. Mm. Now, for me, this has always been a helpful picture. We, God calls us not to be outside people, but to be inside people, to be Tatira, to be one of us, to be in his family forever. He invites us into his home, if you like, into his family. But we cannot come into God's family if we are still relying the, on our own goodness. It's, what we need to do, actually, is to look down at our lives and say, well, look, I might be better than this person in my own estimation, or worse than that person, but the reality is I can never be clean enough to come into God's house by myself. But the good news is that if I'm willing to take off my shoes, that is to say, stop relying on my own goodness, I can then accept the free gift, which is the life of Jesus, which he gave for me freely on the cross, because he's his life is perfect. And by following Jesus, by 
stepping into his shoes, I can then come in and God will treat me as his son or his daughter. And then I'll be part of his family and belong in his family forever. So I want to ask you, where do you and I belong? Where do we call home? Now life doesn't stand still, so probably throughout your, your careers, you will call many different places home. In this country, in, in, uh, in many other countries around the world, probably. But where will you call truly home? Where will your heart be at home? Will your heart be at home with God? Is he your father? Because he is inviting you now to come in. Are you standing on the doorstep wanting to come in? And if that's you today thinking, I want to be in a relationship with God, but I'm just not quite sure if I'm good enough. Well, the good news is that we'll never be good enough. But Jesus is. So all we need to do is to accept his sacrifice on the cross and decide to follow him. So where are you standing today? On the doorstep? Far away? Or are you going to come in? I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't when I when I came to talk. I don't know if that was the angle I was expecting you to come at. Not that it was it was bad. It was just like I don't know. If, I don't know if I felt like you answered the question. Then what does it mean to belong? Um, I guess more in more practical terms. Right. So say for someone like. For me, because I'm an international student, I feel like I have an intersex thing like identity where there's part of me that I guess is back from where I originally come from, but then there's also part of me here and yeah. I live almost like two two separate realities that go in tandem. But they're they're both me. Yeah. So I guess in my context like what does it mean to belong? I don't yeah, I I don't know, I mean yeah, sure. what, what, yeah. We, what are your thoughts on that, I guess? Okay. Uh, yes, I mean I guess if I was giving a talk on anthropology that would a bit more comprehensive. Um, uh, yes, that. I mean, my wife's research. Uh, she's doing a PhD in um, the experience of Chinese students in the UK, uh, and she talks about multiple modernities. That, that people are not from a single culture. That actually, um, most of us, particularly probably everybody here, just by the nature of our experience, we are exposed to. Um, a whole range of different cultures. So you've got your your home culture, you've got the culture that you, uh, it surrounds you, you've got uh, subcultures, you've got uh, an international student subculture, um, yeah, there's a British student subculture, and um, sometimes, I mean, my having talked to many uh, international <coughs> students serving as an international student chaplain at a university, um, I know just how hard it can be for some students to uh, kind of penetrate British undergraduate uh, social circles. Some really succeed, others say, oh, too difficult. Uh, and some try and get hurt. There's a whole range of things. Um, I suppose what I was trying to say is that if we are truly at home in our hearts by belonging to God, then it actually doesn't matter where we are. Um, it doesn't matter whether we, uh, it, or it doesn't even matter whether we feel rejected by the culture or the society around us, because we can truly belong. Um, and that is, I believe, only possible if we are in a relationship with God through Jesus. So, but also from experience, um, being, knowing who you are, is your identity as, from in my case, a British person, as a British person married to a Singaporean, as a Singaporean, or wherever you're from, is that my identity? Because if that's my identity, then that can change, that can be damaged, that can move, that can... Uh, I mean, one thing particularly, I grew up as the youngest person in my whole family, all my cousins and brothers in the world. And I believe that this family would always be there. But then my mum died, and her sister, my aunt, died, and the whole family just sort of seemed to crumble. And so that identity that was around who my family are just started to disappear. And so even our national identity, our cultural identity, 
are subject to change in erosion and damage. But if our home, our identity is truly as God's child, then <coughs> actually we have our security. So I that a little bit better. Thank you. Great. Um, is that one? Hello? Is that one? Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so, when I said there weren't any questions, it wasn't apparently accurate. Um, there was a question, but Peter said he didn't want to answer it. I think I'll ask it anyway. So the question is, Peter, how long did you leave the food in the freezer for? <laughs> <laughs> and a long time. <laughs> uh, when I actually told someone that, uh, I completely lost any kind of uh, concentration. All they could think about was that. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's wise. <laughs> right. Um, so we do have another question. It's. If God wants people to sacrifice animals for their sins, why does why do the animals deserve to suffer when they did not commit sin? Why does God want animal sacrifices in the first place? Right, so just a bit of clarification. Um, when Jesus gave, when this happened with this man, um, this was at a time when uh, the Jewish uh, law was still applied uh, for Jewish people today, they still feel it applies. And there was a whole system of sacrifices, but these sacrifices of animals were uh, designed to say, okay, well, we've done something wrong, so rather than me being punished, um, instead of me being killed, if you like, the animal takes the punishment instead. But after Jesus, that stopped in the Christian understanding, because Jesus himself became that sacrifice. So there is no need to do that. Now the reason why Jesus told him to do it was because that was at a period where this had not yet happened. Jesus was, this is before Jesus died on the cross. So, you know, there are, you can, uh, so that's why Christians don't sacrifice animals. Because we think, well that's not needed, because Jesus sacrificed himself. But I can understand that nobody wants animals to die. Uh, but I'm not a vegetarian, uh, and uh, um, maybe if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, maybe you think that that's a particularly offensive thing. But um, in the Bible, it's used as a picture for the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus. I'm not sure I've... One thing I haven't really answered is, isn't it cruel to animals? Well, um, I'm not sure I can answer that question because that's partly a, an understanding of what animals do and their consciousness and so forth, which is a bit beyond my ability to answer. All right. Great, thank you. That was great. really thoughtful. Um, right, so any questions from the floor? Yeah? <laughs> it's often the, the, the problem of a small group. Yeah, it's, um, sometimes with a bigger group it feels a little bit less personal, so it's easy to do. Um, but please don't worry, I won't be offended if you have a question. Uh, and, or, or if you want to ask questions of the people on your table. And then, uh, yeah, absolutely. If you don't want to ask a question, um, raise your hand and ask a question. You can ask someone else to ask a question for you. I'd like to ask you a question. Is uh, If you have been here this evening, or been here um, uh, through different um, talks, either my talks or the other talks this week. If you would like to take that step, even if you're not 100% sure about what it means, if you would like to come in and be part of God's family, or at least would like to just ask me the question, well, how do I actually do that? Then please don't leave tonight without asking me or um, uh, leaving some of the questions on the table. Um, I'll challenge you because actually um, it's very easy in life to forget because we get busy. But this is the single most important decision you'll ever have. You know, potentially, well not potentially, actually, this is the most important book you'll ever read. And, and I th firmly believe that. Uh, and my life is completely changed. <coughs> now, some people say, well, well, that's fine for you. But I have seen people's lives radically changed 
from every culture you can imagine over the last 30 years. And I'm absolutely convinced that um, it is not only just possible, but it is essential for us to respond to that invitation. So please um, don't leave it um, just for another day, another time. If you're interested and you think, yes, this is something that I want, then please talk to me later. Um, oh. <laughs> this is a question about, um, so in this passage, Jesus does something amazing. We might call it a miracle. Yeah. Um, what makes you or Christians so convinced that this isn't a Darren Brown illusion or um, a kind of slowly it's been mythologized over time and it didn't really happen? Or So what gives you confidence that these amazing things really literally happened? and weren't either blown out of proportion or were just somehow tricks or deceptions. Right. Um, thank you, that's great. Um, yeah, well, first of all, uh, I think this often comes from a... a um, in the West, we tend to sort of autumn... Oh, let me explain all of this. Um, in Western thinking, traditionally, I think this mainly comes from uh, Greek thinking, um, that the world is divided into two spheres. There's the, there's the, the physical realm that we um, can touch, taste, feel, uh, measure, investigate scientifically, and then there is the spiritual realm, which is well, God and everything else. And and in Western thinking, as a habit, we don't tend to think that these two touch very much. And if they do, it's called a miracle, and we go wow. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, a long time ago, when I was uh, uh, in my late teens, I simply just didn't believe that one existed at all. I simply believed the physical unit of the universe existed. But I've come to realize that actually most of the world doesn't think like that. Most of the world sees that the physical and the spiritual world are together, that you can't really separate them. So, for example, if someone um, crashes their car, yes, that may be because they were driving too fast and the roads were wet and maybe they had too much to drink. But there may be other reasons as well. Uh, and so the physical or the, the empirical uh, uh, reason for something and the spiritual reason for something are not exclusive. So when uh, we look at the Bible, we kind of go, well, people are not peeled like that. Then that is actually often a Western assumption that the physical and spiritual world don't meet. But also, miracles happen today. And if you want to know why I believe that, you can talk to me later. But um, um, it is it is not just something that happened a long time ago. Um, miracles happen today. And um, the other thing to say is that the Bible is pretty consistent. You see, if you're going to believe in a God who is over the universe, and it's entirely possible that God can heal someone. Uh, I mean, in fact, actually, it would be a bit ridiculous to suggest that God can't or doesn't. So it ought, we ought to be looking in the Bible. If Jesus is God, then he should be able to do those things. I hope that helps. Could, do you want to come back to me? It's, um, it's sort of hanging on the edge for me, saying that miracles do happen today, but speak to me later. Could you, give, could you whet my appetite on that? Or? Okay. <laughs> um, um, okay, well, um, my wife used to have migraines, migraines and severe headaches um, that make you kind of really feel sick and in bed. Um, we, she used to lo lose at least a day a week like that. Um, and they went from being every four weeks to every three weeks, then pretty much every week. Uh, even with medication, she would feel like that. It always brought on my stress, um, lack of sleep, and uh, uh, irregular meal times. Then her sister uh, went into the hospital, she had to drop everything and rush to Singapore every night. So, lack of sleep, stress, uh, irregular meal times. And she just went into her room very quietly and said to God, I can't cope with migraines as well. Can you please take me away? That was 13 years ago, and she hasn't had one since. 
So no kind of big blinding flashes of light, no angels speaking or anything like that. We just went. And that's a very small example. Um, but there are many, many more. Thank you. Great. Um, we have actually had a question come in. So it says, what does belonging with God and Jesus actually look like? Oh, that's a great question. What does it look like? Yeah, okay. Um, Christians quite often talk about a relationship with God. Um, and so I think because we say it so easily, it's, it's easy to forget what we mean by that. Or, and actually, we really do mean a relationship with God. Because a relationship is only a relationship if it's two-way. If you're speaking to God and God is speaking to you. Now, I'm not suggesting I'm hearing voices in the night. But a relationship with God is one which is two-way, where you know what God is saying to you. And most of the time it is from regular reading of the Bible. But, um, can I just put the question past me again so I'm not getting off the time. Okay, so it's part of being God's being part of God's family, which is the church. So it's being part of a group of people who are um, uh, learning and uh, uh, together what it means to follow Jesus, but also looking after each other. The same way that we encourage our children to look after each other, as well as just listen to what we say. Um, it means uh, learning to do uh, what Jesus wants in the world. So actually being good to people outside the church um, and it's about drawing closer to God in a loving relationship um, every day. Let me just read out this verse to you which um, this was written by Peter who was one of the people who saw Jesus rise from the dead not just once but over a period of weeks and he writes to people like you and me who have not seen Jesus rise from the dead and he said uh, but Christians, he said, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. So what a relationship with God looks like is you can't see him. Nevertheless, it's a real, tangible relationship, which is filled with joy. A joy that doesn't come from having money or status, but a joy that comes from belonging to God. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for all your patience. Okay. Thanks.